Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press, including this lecture, are made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Help us to help humanity by making a donation. Telema Press is a non-profit corporation. Donations are tax-deductible. For more information, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Taurus. A lecture today related with the zodiacal sign of Taurus from our uh, esoteric course of uh, astrology. Well, as we said in the last lecture, the theurgy. Let us remember that the logos, the word, is uh, theos, God itself. That uh, is not a person but what we call the army of the boys. <coughs> when arriving to the topic of this lecture, it opens a very vast scenario in relation with the bull. We find the symbol of the bull in all religions. And uh, <clears throat> before entering into the topic of why we are, or why all religions have this symbol, we have to explain in detail how we are related to the sign of Taurus. For that, we had to apply to alchemy and Kabbalah. Because uh, when we study Kabbalah and alchemy, Fourthly, we had to go into astrology. Many scholars <coughs> know very well that astrology is a science, very old science. And uh, 
is a science, esoterically speaking, related with the consciousness. The way in which we relate the consciousness with the cosmos and how the cosmos is related with us. Remember that it is stated that the human being is a microcosmos of the macrocosmos. So here we had to comprehend how the constellations or the zodiacal signs in astrology are related with the elements. Remember that uh, we stated that fire, air, water, and earth are related with the 12 constellations. When we inquire, when we investigate the zodiacal signs, we discover that every element of the four esoteric elements that we name uh, fire, air, water, and earth are related with three zodiacal signs. Here we are arriving at the constellation of Taurus, which is related with the element earth. <coughs> In the element earth, we have three signs, which are Taurus, Virgo and Capricorn. Why are always three uh, signs or constellations related with the four elements? It is because the forces of the elements that work through the constellations are related with our three brains. Remember that we always state that the human being is a three-brained being, a three-centered being, because we have three brains. The intellectual brain, located in the brain that we call the head, but we better we say that is the cerebrum spinal nervous system. And then we have the other brain, which is the emotional brain, related with the grand sympathetic nervous system. And uh, the parasympathetic or vagus, which is the motor instinctual sexual brain. These are precisely how we are constituted. And how we have to study it in relation with astrology, with ourselves. If we study astrology from that point of view, we will understand very well how the astros work in our physical body. The three brains are always related with the three elements, which are called in alchemy, air, fire, and water. We stated in other lectures about the uh, mother letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which are always placed in the center when we explain the elements, which are the M, the letter Shin, which is uh, fire, and uh, Aleph, which is air. Mem is water. So we find here air related with Aleph, Shin related with fire, and Mem related with water. All of these three elements are located in the physical body, which in synthesis is the earth. That's why when we talk about the earth, we talk directly related to the physical body to this human organism that has all the elements in potentiality 
all the forces of the astros in order for us to become a microcosmo. With this statement, we are emphasizing that the microcosmos is a cosmos that can emerge if we put in activity <coughs> all the elements that a physical body has. Because if we place a true microcosmos, which is a true human being, next to us, we will see that physically are similar. We will say they have human bodies. But the difference is inside, in their psyche. The true human being, the microcosmos, has a complete development of all the human attributes within, in the psyche and in the spirit. When I say psyche, is because psyche is, uh, or psyche uh, means soul in Greek. So here we have, and we have to understand why we, the Gnostics, emphasize always that we are not human beings. Even though we have physical bodies of human beings. But a true human being is not only physical, but psychological and spiritual. Many times we explain that the word human comes from whom, which means spirit. And man, which means manas, mind. A mind which is united to the spirit. In Gnosticism, we have two types of mind. The concrete mind and the abstract mind. The abstract mind is what we call human soul. And the concrete mind is the mind that we use in order to reason. So, that is the man. But when we investigate the psyche of each one of us, we discover that we have all the elements of the microcosm, but in potentiality. Are like microorganisms that we had to develop and to put in activity in order to become a real microcosm. And the constellation of Taurus has precisely that beautiful knowledge about it. When we investigate the bull, the Taurus, we discover that is the symbol of the earth. <coughs> when we go into the symbol of the Sphinx, because that you know is a very ancient symbol. Actually, it is an Atlantean symbol. In the Atlantean civilization, there was a society that was called the Akaldan or Akaldana Society that was formed by masters that have developed that within themselves and that were teaching to the Atlanteans this uh, wisdom. The temple of the Sphinx, as you know, the Sphinx is a symbol of the elements, the four elements. The paws of the lion is fire the wings of the eagle, the air, the face of the human being, the water, and the legs of the bull that we are talking here, the earth. You see the legs? If you, put, uh, you, if you stand that sphinx on, his, on her or its feet, the legs, you see that is the foundation, the earth. That's why when we study the tatuas or elements related with the physical body, we always place the earth at the very bottom, from the knees to the feet. We find the vibration of the element earth. From the knees to the sex, the water. From the sex to the heart, the fire. From the heart 
to the throat, the air, and from the throat to the pineal gland, the ether, as a fifth element. So then we find there that uh, the temple of the Sphinx was called in the time of Atlantis the University of Akaldana, where all the initials were there learning uh, all the forces of nature in relation with the astros, in relation with the stars. This uh, temple, this university, still exists but not in the three-dimensional world. Because if you go physically to the uh, place where the Sphinx is with the pyramids in Egypt, you find only ruins of what was, in the ancient times, a great civilization. <coughs> but the uh, Egyptians, the Atlantean Egyptians, or we will say it better, the Atlantean Mayans, because the Mayans, Egyptians, were the same Atlanteans that built those uh, monuments and that had a lot of knowledge in the three-dimensional world. But they place all of their great uh, colleges of this type of wisdom in the fourth dimension. Now, if somebody wants to assist to these temples or universities, colleges of initiates in order to receive the wisdom of nature and the cosmos. This person has to learn how to project themselves into the astral plane, the fifth dimension, or to place their physical body into gene state, which means to put the physical body into the fourth dimension in order to, to break the law of gravity and to travel in that unknown dimension to Egypt. And then he will discover that this university in which we learn all of this wisdom still exists, but they un within the unknown dimension. There are many, for instance, uh, apparatuses that the Akaldan civilization uh, created that uh, managed to put the physical matter <coughs> into the fourth dimension in order to le levitate it and place it in any place they want. Levitation is one of the laws that drains in the fourth fifth and other dimensions, while the law of gravity, as you know, reigns in the three-dimensional world. Let me tell you that the Sphinx, with the pyramids in Egypt, were located in the south of Africa before, and before being there in the south of Africa were located in the Atlantean Ocean. But at that time, the Atlantic Ocean was not an ocean, but Atlantis. So the Atlantis had that power, or we would say the technology, to take the gravity of the physical matter and to transfer it into the fourth dimension to the places they wanted. And this is how they build the pyramids. Not only in Egypt, the pyramids of Egypt or, or, of, uh, or the Sphinx, but in other places in the world. Because there were many types of Sphinx and, and, and uh, pyramids. So, the Egyptians were worshipping the bull Apis. And if you inquire in that civilization, you see how they worship the bull Apis. Unfortunately, people in this three-dimensional world who ignore about the signs of the Egyptians and the Mayans, they state that the ancients were worshipping idols and point at the signs of the bull Apis as a idol worshipping. 
because they ignore the deep significance or the deep meaning of the esoteric wisdom related with the bull. You see, for instance, that uh, the planet Earth rotates to uh, around the, the sun. In esotericism, Gnosticism, we name our sun O-R-S, Ors. That's the name which the sun is known, or the solar system is known in other parts of the universe. The solar system of Ors, because the name of this sun, I repeat, is Ors. So the solar system of Ors, to which the planet Earth belongs, belongs to a constellation. Because when you see in the sky different constellations, every star is a sun. So you, you ever asked to yourself to which constellation our solar system belongs to? Well, we'll say, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, esoterically, gnostically speaking, it belongs to the constellation of Taurus. In the constellation of Taurus, we find the Pleiades, which are seven, they call it seven sisters, or seven cos. Sometimes they call it seven goats. The reality is that the Pleiades is a group of stars, or system of stars, which center is Alcyon. Alcyon, the Alcyon star, is the center of the Pleiades, and uh, around this Alcyon rotate seven suns. The Bible talks, and sometimes this always quotes, the Pleiades. People never wonder why, for instance, in the book of Job, the Pleiades is, is, is uh, quoted. And it is because the Pleiades is the constellation of the group star that we belong to. The seventh sun or solar system that rotates around Alcyon is our solar system. That's why when you see the Pleiades, you see only seven. Of course, the Pleiades itself is formed by many stars. But we are talking here only this particular system of seven suns that rotate around Alcyon, and behind them you find many other stars, because when you inquire that, uh, astrologically speaking, you find many stars. So, that's why we don't realize that, but esoterically, not strictly speaking, and in, in the Atlantean civilization, in the Akkadian society, everybody knew that our sun belongs to the Pleiades. And the Pleiades are those stars which are in the constellation of Taurus. <coughs> so that's why this constellation of Taurus has a great significance to the planet Earth. And not only to the planet Earth, but to all the planets of the solar system. And that's why the bull, Apis, is, uh, it, wa it was uh, worshipped in, in ancient Egypt. Because all of the forces that we have in the planet Earth comes from the constellation of Taurus. Because we belong to it. And of course, as you know, or as I am telling you, the seven sun that rotates around Alcyon are sun orbs. In the rotation around Alcyon, our sun orbs automatically passes through the whole zodiacal belt. The zodiacal belt, as you know, is related with the 12 constellations that uh, we are pointing here in that uh, the first one is Arius, which is precisely when you see the map, stellar map, to the right of Taurus. 
So in its voyage, the solar system passes to the zodiacal belt. Or we will say that the radiation of the constellation of the zodiacal belt influences the solar system and the Earth in its voyage. That's, that's why you find these uh, signs that is called uh, the signs of Tauromachy or bullfighting. When you go into Spain, you find a lot of people that like to go to that uh, what we call sport that they have in which they have to submit the bull in different ways. It is called the art of tarumaki. If you ever question from where this type of art is coming from, or this type of celebration that is very common in Spain. Let us state here and uh, emphasize that Spain was one of the lands of Atlantis. The coast, we will say, it, of Atlantis. Because Atlantis was a huge continent that was occupying all the Atlantic Ocean. Atlantis is not like people think it was an island there in the Mediterranean or in some part of the earth, a little city. It was a huge continent that united Europe, Africa, with the continent of, of America. America, of course, at that time was not as we see it in the maps. But just the coast, we will say. Mexico, the states of South, uh, South States of the United States, part of South America, Central America, and the Caribbean islands, of course, belonging to Atlantis. At that time, the north of the United States and Canada was within the bottom of the ocean. After the submerge of that continent, those lands emerged and the physiognomy of the earth changed. So Spain was part of Atlantis. So when that continent sank, Spain remained, and also Africa, the north of Africa, where you find now the pyramids and the Sphinx. If people investigate, for instance, the bottom of the ocean or the coast of Spain, Portugal, they will find remains of Atlantis, and also in all the Atlantic Ocean. There was a huge continent. So, in Atlantis, the worship of the bull was something very common. Because of what I'm explaining here in relation with the constellation of Taurus and the forces of Taurus. Not because they thought that the bull was a god, as many ignoramuses think. That they thought that God has the face of a bull, or that God has the face of an ibis, and all of that. Because we know very well that all of that is symbol. Of the elements. Depending what element you are talking, if you talk the, about the god ibis, you're talking about the element air. Because the air is always related with birds, like eagle. Like the white dove of the Holy Spirit. Because we are always, as I said, divided in three brains. 
When you talk about the fire in relation with your heart, when you talk about the lion, but the lower area is always related with the bull, or what the Bible calls the behemoth, the cattle, the strength of the earth in our body. So, Tarumaki was a ceremony celebrated in honor to Poseidon, in honor to Neptune. When we study astrology or the forces of the planets related with the physical body, we discover that the pineal gland is governed by Neptune, by Poseidon, astrologically speaking. <coughs> this is why very psychic people have a very strong <coughs> pineal gland. But we all hear that uh, in the science of endocrinology, we know that the pineal gland, as we said in the last lecture, controls the development of the sexual glands. And the sexual glands is, are related with the water, with the waters of creation. So that's why it is stated that Poseidon, in the microcosmos human body, controls the waters, in which we find the fish, symbol of the seed, the sperm and the ovum. So that ma marvelous axis of pineal gland, sexual glands, is something very uh, very common related in the study of endocrinology, the relation of the pineal gland with all the endocrine system. The Atlanteans knew a lot about the endocrine system. Not like as, as we know in this very, because the science of endocrinology is, a, is still in the embryonic state in this day and age. Related with the Atlantean civilization, they knew a lot. Not only the secretion of the endocrine glands, which are called hormones, but also the relation of those glands with the tatuas or vibrations of nature in relation with the planets and the stars. We will say that our civilization still, if we compare it with the Atlantean civilization, still we are, we will say, the, at the knees, at the level of the knees in relation with the brain that the Atlanteans had because they had, at this time in this Kali Yuga, in this era in which we are right now, at that time in Atlantis, they already were traveling in all the planets, having very, better, better rockets than those that we have. So, the bull was a ceremony, was a symbol in Atlantis, in which the initiate has to control his... Uh, animal forces by activating the pineal gland comes into my mind in this very moment this uh, king Minos or Minos from Greece according to mythology he promised to the god Poseidon if he assists him and protect him he will offer a bull as a sacrifice for him. And the god Poseidon approved it and gave him a white bull that he created from the foam of the ocean. Poseidon also, according to mythology, created other animals with the foam of the ocean, like horses. This is a symbol, of course. Because the waters of the ocean, in the beginning God was hovering upon the face of the waters. 
that Ruach Elohim that the Bible talks about that hovered on top of the waters are the symbol of the energy of the Holy Spirit which is creation that creates with the power of the waters sex Poseidon of course in Greek mythology represents the Holy Spirit because the atom of the Holy Spirit in alchemy is precisely in the pineal gland in other lecture we stated that we have the Holy Trinity in our brain the Father is in the magnetic center of the root of our nose the Son is in the pituitary gland and the Holy Spirit in the pineal gland so the pineal gland is a seat of the soul and the forces of the Holy Spirit that control the waters of sexuality so when in mythology it is stated that Poseidon created a white bull that's something that implies the correct use of the sexual energy because the bull in itself represents the forces of the blood in the physical body that transform themselves into sperms and ovum which in alchemy is called the salt of the earth when you go into the ocean you find that the water is salty has salt but the salt of the earth in reality is that matter which is in the water which in this case in the symbol of Poseidon in mythology is the sperm or the ovum of the sexual water <coughs> that crystallizes that's the bull of the strength of the earth because you know that the sperms and the ovums are uh, the, in the final synthesis the outcome of the blood an organism so when somebody transmute the sexual energy is of course worshipping the Holy Spirit the Bible states you shall not fornicate because he who fornicates thinks against the Holy Ghost or do you ignore that your physical body is a temple of the Holy Ghost and that God dwells within you it is referring of course to the sexual creative force of the Holy Spirit dwells in, in us so when you are in chastity and you transmute your sexual energy you are worshipping the Holy Spirit that is called the baptism of waters of alchemy or oh, this is, as you said, uh, in the ancient times, in, in, in Atlantis, that was called the worshipping of Poseidon, the god of the waters, the Holy Spirit. So, by delivering a white bull to the king Minos, means to transmute the sexual matter, to do it in the right way, that's the way to worship Poseidon. He says, offer me a bull. But that bull doesn't mean the cattle that we find there in the fields. It means your own behemoth, your own bull force, animal force, you should use and transmute it in order to worship, in order to honor the Holy Spirit, in order to honor Poseidon, in order to activate your pineal gland, which is the door of heaven, the chakra sahasrara, or the church of La Odyssea that opens the door of heaven in order to go there into the higher levels of your being. But the king Minos, when he saw this bull, got in love with it. So I'm going to kill this bull. Hide it. Instead he was, of course, uh, doing all the type of sacrifices, all the kind of uh, herd that he had in Greece in order to worship Poseidon and not doing that that Poseidon gave him to him. Means, this means 
that when the Holy Spirit, the forces of heaven, are giving us the strength of the bull in our physical body, in order to return the force and to worship the Holy Spirit, we have to transmute the sexual energy. And that's the symbol of the white bull. The symbol of apis. It's not, of course, as the people think. When you see the bull, immediately is re- a reference to the physical body. Because this is what we have. All the strength of the physical body is what we call behemoth, which is precisely in the blood. Related with the system that we have in the physical body. And all of that strength is what we have to apply in order to worship God. Remember one of the commandments. They say, you shall worship your God, you shall love your God with all your strength. Of course, it says with all your mind, with all your heart, and with all your strength. But that strength, of course, is because the, the strength of any human physical body comes from the blood. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how you apply it. You apply it in your motor's uh, center, and then you are, of course, like these bodybuildings, building a lot of muscles because using the power of behemoth in the blood through the motor center. Or to be a, a football player or a baseball player, that they develop body. And uh, in the other way, for instance, the karate or kung fu fighters. Or we will say boxing with the instinctual center. And would you apply that strength to the, to the development of that type of sport? Could be as instinctual or motor. And in the sex, well, you know, this is a, a topic which humanity is very uh, preoccupied in this day and age. How to have sexual strength. How to utilize that sexual strength. And that is strength that the commandment of Moses states, you shall love your God with all your strength. I mean, you have to apply all that energy for your psyche, for your spirit, in order to worship the Holy Spirit, Poseidon, to sublimate the energy. And that is to submit the bull. And that is the whole science that was represented in Tauromachy or bullfighting at that time in the Atlantean, uh, Atlantean civilization. At that time, the bull that they utilized in order to represent the work that we had to perform <coughs> was not killed in the pitiful way that in this day and age the toreros do it. Just kill the animal in order to satisfy the thirst of blood of the multitudes. In the time of Atlantis, they didn't do that. They were submitting the bull, they were controlling it with ropes, different ways, mastery. And after they were finishing that ceremony, or that way in which they were teaching, the way in which we had to control our forces, they were releasing the animal. Not killing it. Of course, if you observe what you call the bull arena, which is always a circle, then you have to imagine and to understand that that circle arena in which the Bullfighting is uh, performed is a symbol of the zodiacal belt in which all the people sit observing the work that they have to perform within themselves. All the 12 tribes of Israel sit there observing the, the ritual. The fight. It's called the 12 tribes of Israel are the 12 zodiacal signs. 
and uh, 12 forces that we had to put in activity, or we had to develop by defeating the bull. Behold here, if you know about this art of tarumaki, how the torero, before going to fight the bull, to fight the beast, to, buy, to fight the behemoth, he of course kneel before God in order to receive help. And this is something very significant and beautiful. Because in this day and age, what the Torero does is to kneel behind the Virgin. The Virgin of Carmel. The Virgin of the Sea. Stella Marius. Here we have to state, to emphasize again, the duality or the two polarities of the Holy Spirit. Because it's always represented in all religions. The feminine aspect of the Holy Spirit is represented in the ancient Egypt in many ways. But in this uh, relationship with the bull, we can say is the goddess Hathor, which is represented with horns and with the sun between her horns, among Ra, the solar force. The goddess Hathor is the same Isis, because remember that the feminine forces of the cosmos are related or divided in five aspects. But here, the goddess Hathor is what in Christianity called Mary, Isis, Maia, Isoberta, Rhea, Sibeles, Maya. There's many names. Of course, those women that in ancient times achieved the self-realization of their being had the privilege or the honor of representing that force which has no form. They can take any form. The Mother Earth, the Mother Moon, or the forces and the feminine aspect of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit that manifests itself to the sexual organs cannot create in a man if he doesn't unite with the Holy Spirit that procreates to the sexual organs of a woman. The two polarities, male-female, is what we call E.O., I-O, which are precisely the symbol of the number 10 and the base of our decimal uh, numbers. EO <coughs> also bring us to memory the goddess EO that transformed herself into a cow, into a cow, in order to escape from Era that was trying to hurt her because Zeus was in love with her. And we find how in mythology this god transformed itself into a bull in order to have sexual intercourse. And in this case, the female is often transformed into a cow. It's a symbol. Behold how in India the cow is holy. Is worshipped. But of course, many Indians lost the symbol, the meaning of it. The cow is a symbol of life and represents, in this case, as the bull represents the brutal force that we have in our physical body as man, the cow represents that vital force that has the woman in her body. The milk that the woman gives in order to sustain life. And this is how we find this symbol in many religions. The Divine Mother, wife of the Holy Spirit, is represented in many religions, in many ways. 
before going to fight against the beast. They initiate kneel before the divine mother in order to the, the divine mother to give her or to give him the strength to fight the bull. Because she knows <clears throat> that that bull is circulating in the blood of all her children. And she is the only one that can transform that venom blood into oxygen blood by the way of transmutation. This is why the symbol of the divine cow is in different ways. So you see how, for instance, in bullfighting, the first that appear on the arena in the center of that circus are the picadores are called. The picadores that appear with a big lance riding a horse and trying to submit to control the bull with the lance. That is a crude symbol of the beginners. Those that start on the path of the civilization. They know that the strength that they have to control is circulating in their blood. That the sexual force is the force that they have to control. The animal force of the bull. But they still have to dominate the physical body which in this case is the symbol of the horse, which they are riding, trying to control the animal, riding another animal. This is how we start. It's not easy. With the perseverance, we go, and if we keep dominating, controlling the forces of the bull, which circulates in the energies of the body, we finally arrive to the level of companion, which are called in the bullfight, the banderilleros, the ones that appear without the horse and just wait for the bull and put their banderillas in the body of the bull. They are more skillful. They already can face the bull in different ways. But of course, on top of those banderilleros are the toreros, which are the masters, that already have their solar bodies created. Because when you see the torero appearing in the arena, you see that with the golden suit, and walking with elegance. That golden suit is called in Greek language, Tosoma Heliacon, the solar body of the solar man. Meaning that in order to reach the mastery, you have to transmute your sexual force and to create the astral body, the mental body, the causal body. This is called solar bodies. That's why those beings that become solar, with those solar bodies, are called masters. And that honor the sun through their work. That's why in mythology it is stated that Apollo was worshipped by the cowherds, the ones that uh, were submitted, submitted the force of the bull to the sun. Because in the end, you have to understand that the solar energy is placed in the sexual glands. And when you transmute that, you become enlightened. It comes into my mind the word enlightenment. Buddha means enlightened. Buddha Gautama he says that he was the cow, cow herd. The one that controlled the forces in the body. And of course, Apollo is the son, Febo Apollo, in mythology. 
that the gods were honored to him as well. But that is, of course, the symbol of the forces that you managed within your psyche, within your spirit, within your physical body. Of course, as you see the torero appearing in the arena, it's having the cape that he utilized in order to put in front of the bull, which is a symbol of Maya, meaning that he is controlling the animal. And he can do whatever he wants with the animal. The animal is no longer frightening him. Because he's a master. That's why he reached that level. And has the sword. That sword, of course, is a symbol of the spinal column. The energy of the master. It has the sword that can kill the bull. But that bull, of course, as I said are all those animals that we have within, that we have to submit, that we have to conquer, that we have to kill. But you see how everything is misinterpreted in different ways. Now, in Spain, in Portugal, in Mexico also, you find those toreros that appear there, and they're fighting the bull, and at the end they kill the bull. But they don't kill their own internal bull. Still, they are not masters. It's just a symbol. It's like in masonry. You find that many masons call themselves uh, uh, of the 33rd degree. In order to reach the 33rd degree, you have to be uh, Jesus Christ. Because he lived 33 years. Symbol of those 33 vertebrae that we have in the spinal column. In order to conquer ourselves. But in this day and age, there are many Masons that have that degree, or 32nd degree of Masonry, and they don't know anything about this. As well, there are Toreros, and many people that in Spain, Mexico, and Portugal, and many other countries that celebrate that Tauromachy, and they don't know anything about this. They just follow the current, the traditions. They don't know that that comes from Atlantis. All of that was celebrated in Mora about it, but in different ways. And as I said, in the time of Atlantis, the bull also was trying to con be controlled, but never killed. The killing of the bull is a sacrilege. It's a symbol. It's an innocent animal. In the book of Exodus, chapter 29, it's a described there the way in which a bull has to be killed. And it's unjustly uh, referred to Moses, that Moses wrote that. But really, the one that adulterated the doctrine of Moses was Ezra's. And he is the one that placed all of those things that now are attributed to Moses. Never in the ancient times was the bull killed or sacrificed as is described in this uh, alliteration of the Bible, in Exodus chapter 29. People think, oh yeah, because it's written in the Bible, it's holy. No, there are many things in the Bible that were introduced by the Black Lodge. That those blood sacrifices, the only blood that we have to sacrifice is our own blood. Because this whole transformation. Life is in our blood. And a transformation that happens in our body is in relation with our blood. Many people in this day talk about the holy blood, the royal blood of Jesus. Always in, out, in the outside world. Without ignoring that that blood that we have to transform is inside. Jesus has to appear inside of us. That's the royal blood that we have to, to manage. By transforming the poison blood that we have, or the venom blood, which is related with the bull. Because as we were explaining in the beginning, when Poseidon saw that this god Minos, or the king Minos, he didn't uh, perform what he promised, then he made his wife to get in love with the bull, the white bull. And then it's stated there that uh, this uh, Daedalus, 
who was a, a, a great inventor, created a cow, an artificial cow, in order to put the queen inside the cow, in order for the queen to have sex with the bull. So they managed to do it, and the bull made sex to the queen. The outcome was the Minotaur. This is a great symbol there, of course. Our own nature. But when we promise to enter into the path, but we don't do it, and we will sacrifice all the things, but we don't transmute the sexual energy, at the end, our own nature, which is a symbol of the queen, transform the fire, the holy fire of that white bull that represents the force in the body of the Holy Spirit into a minotaur, a monster, which dwells within each one of us. That monster is Medusa, minotaur, and has many names. But in this beautiful myth, myth you find that has, of course, a human body, but a head of a bull and a tail. And that is precisely the most beautiful representation of humanity on this planet Earth. Because everybody in itself is a minotaur. If you inquire and investigate the face of every human being in the mental plane, because in the physical plane we have the face of a human being, but in the mental plane everybody has a face of an animal, usually a bull. And the tail, which symbolizes the way in which we control the sexual energy, energy in the wrong way. Which is called the kunda buffer, or the tail of Satan. Which is developed when we manage the forces of the animal in the wrong way. When we don't follow the rules which are written in all religions. And that's why we have to transform ourselves into a perseus. In order to go into the labyrinth, which is our mind... Because that's the power in the center of the labyrinth is precisely the bull, the minotaur, which is ourselves. We have to go there and to kill it. And for that we have to follow the rules which are written in a very, very uh, wise way in this myth of the minotaur. So we hold here how everything is symbolized. If you conquer it, of course, then you become a holy bull. But you have to transform it. That's why ancient people knew that, and that's why they were worshipping the, the bull apis. It says, bull apis, the symbol of the Holy Spirit, the spouse, or the divine cow, the divine mother. And their son was the calf, or kabir, which his name was Aurus. It's written H O R U S, Horus, but it's pronounced Aurus. And from that comes the T, which is a symbol of the cross in which we have to work with, and Aurus, Taurus. That Taurus, of course, rules the throat. When you investigate, The throat is the area in which Taurus works. And when we go into the throat, we find that this mysterious sephira, or the tree of life, is precisely placed, located at the level of the throat. And that mystery sephira is called Da'at, Gnosis, knowledge. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. It's written. Here you see how Arus or Horus with the Tao the cross. You, you can divide also. Tau. The cross Tau. In Aurus. Taurus. This is the symbol. 
of the Taurinian mysteries. Which are now lost in the space. But, uh, but fortunately, the Gnostic Church keeps that. Because everything, all wisdom, all knowledge that was lost in this three dimensional world, it was not lost in the fourth dimension. It still exists. Maybe here people will burn books, destroy wisdom of other civilization, but that wisdom remains in the fourth dimension within the sacred temples for the white lodge. So the letter or the letter tal or the seal, the cross tal, is the symbol of the logos. Taurus or the symbol of Aurus. Because this Aurus or Horus, the calf, son of Hathor and Apis, or son of Isis and Osiris, of course, the symbol of the forces of the Taurus that had to develop in our throat by the mysteries of that. When we talk about the sexual forces in relation with the waters, in relation with the body, we have always pronounced the word. We have always state the word. Don't forget that the spirit of God was floating on the face of the water, the sexual waters of Genesis. But in order for those waters to become active and to create, God said, let there be light, and the light was. Because the Elohim, the angels, create with the power of the throat. The power of the Logos is here in the heart, in the throat. The power of God is in the throat. That's why it's called Logos. That's why in the book of John it's called the Word. That in the beginning was the word. Because God creates with the power of the throat. Here in this three dimensional world. We create with the power of the sex. But we have to learn. We have to develop. And we have to reach the level of God's. If we want to become as Elohim. Creating like the gods. We have to know good and evil. Good and evil. We have to conquer the tree of knowledge. We have to conquer Lucifer. We have to conquer Behemoth. We have to take the stone, which is a symbol of the foundation of Yesod, and to kill Goliath with the power of our sex. And Goliath is that Behemoth that everybody has inside. The work of David. But David is a king. So you see here how Taurus is a symbol of the word that God created the word or created I mean the world, the universe the solar systems, the galaxies, with the power of the verb, the word, which is developed when we know how to transmute the sexual energy. You know very well that when one is a child, has a very, we will say, the subtle voice, but when we enter into maturity, the voice changes. And it's because from the 14 year of life to the 21, the third level of the testicles create sperms. And those sperms, those hormones, go into the level of the throat. And we have that grave voice of a man, a mature man. The woman also changes. Her voice, but in the feminine aspect. So here you see 
the relationship of the sexual gland with the throat. Obviously, the gods, the Elohim, the, the angels, have that power of the word. That is what is called the power of tongues, which is attributed to the Holy Spirit. Remember that the Holy Spirit, I repeat, is related with the sexual glands, with the pineal gland. But also the sexual glands, sexual glands are related with all the glands of the human organism. So, it is stated that when you control the bull, then you develop power in your throat, in your verb, in your word. And that is precisely what we call understanding. When you investigate the chakras, or the power that is called here, clear audience. What is clear audience? It's a power related with Taurus. But that is a power that really has many levels. Because it's in relation with that, which is knowledge. In that knowledge, we find the union of the two polarities of Bina, the Holy Spirit, or the Bull Apis, with the Divine Mother, Hathor. Bina, as you know, in Hebrew, means understanding, comprehension, intelligence. So when we arrive to this point, we have to understand that is what we want. That is what we want to attain. The development of objective reasoning. Objective reasoning is interrelated with clear audience. Clairvoyance is a way in which you see Things which are not for this three-dimensional world. But clear audience is the way in order to hear. Which is not from this three-dimensional world. And that is what is called the power of tongues. The way in which you understand, comprehend other sounds. The lecture that we give in relation with uh, Gnosticism sometimes are very difficult to place in the English language. Sometimes we apply to Sanskrit, or to Hebrew, or to Latin, or to Greek, in order to point something that in the English language does not exist. Or the, I mean, the words, in order to describe them, does not exist. Or do not exist. And that's why... How you all understand how uh, the people degenerated in the ancient times where they didn't control the bull. When they allowed their own particular behemoth, their own bull, to control their life, the power of the word, the power of the throat, was lost. And then the Tower of Babel emerged. The Tower of Babel, as you know, is the creation of the emerged of many languages in which people do not understand each other. But the language, the word, is always related with what we speak. If I tell you chair, immediately you associate that word in your mind with a chair and you see the image of the chair in your mind. And as a table, you associate that word with the image in your mind. So you see how the word is related with objects. That's why it is stated that in the beginning God geometricized. Because the word is already proof that when you record your words in a tape for a recorder... And if you observe that tape with a microscope, you will see that your words are recorded in that tape with 
geograph uh, what says uh, geometrical figures, triangles, squares, circles, pentagons, and different geometrical figures. So when the needle, the magnetic needle passes on top of those geometrical figures of the tape, you hear what you said or what somebody sang. So the word is associated with geometry and everything that is created, concretely created, is related with geometry. That's why we say that everything has a sound. But of course, the language that we speak in this day and age are very poor. Scarcely we associate that with images. But when God in the beginning said, let there be light, that word of God, of course, in his own mind, is seeing the light, is seeing the things. Is associated with what we call the golden language. In ancient times, before the emergence of all those multiple languages that we speak in this planet now, humanity spoke only one language. And that's called the language of gold, or the golden language. And that language is associated with nature. It's associated with the universe. So, when people were talking at that time and saying anything, that word, that phrase was associated with the forces of nature. That's why people were very careful to utter words, to say things. Because that's the magical word that in this time, we call it mantras, prayers, in which we control the forces of nature or control the forces of, of the cosmos in our favor. If you want to receive this help, pronounce this prayer, pronounce this mantra, pronounce this, pronounce that, because you want those energies to return into your psyche or to put in activity those forces that you already have in your body. But in ancient times, Lemurians, they knew already, or they were in, in communion with nature. And the language that they spoke was related with the forces of nature. They had the power of tongues. That's the power of tongues. When they hear the sounds of animals, of the wind, of the forest, of the fire, they knew that that was associated with the forces and they understood what was going on. But now we only hear sounds, noises, meows, barkings. When somebody emerged in Europe, whose name is St. Francis of Assisi, everybody, of course, celebrates. Oh, it's a saint. He knows how to talk with animals. Anybody can talk with animals. If that body develops the power of the throat, which is the power of tongues. And not only with animals. In communication with the forces of the universe. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and with God. And God is everywhere. So when you enter into the mystery of the word, which is the heart, the throat, then you enter into the mysteries of the word. Into the mysteries of Aurus, which develop because that force develops with the cross, with the Tau cross, with the symbol of the union of the man with the woman. That's the T, the Tau. And Aurus means the fire that developed that within you through the power of the mantra. That's why the Master Samael Onbeor insisted that we had to practice mantras, vocalizations. That's why in the sexual alchemy you transmute and you pronounce words. Because the words have power 
on the sexual forces. It is beautiful to, to see that. And from that come the Taurinian mysteries. The Taurinian mysteries are that mysteries associated, of course, with the tauromachy, the domination of the bull, in order to acquire the development of the throat, the clary audience, objective reasoning. You might say, well, that reasoning should be associated with the brain in the head, <coughs> because of how we reason. But here, let me tell you that really, in the brain, you have the reasoning, but that comes from your throat. And not only from your throat, but from all the chakras of the human organism. <coughs> As you see, objective reasoning is a way in which your reason <coughs> is associated with the forces of nature and the cosmos. Developing your inner being, the microcosmos. And then you acquire the power of tongues. Many initiates that acquire the power of tongues wrote many sacred books. <coughs> Those sacred books, scarcely written in different languages, are associated with the forces of nature, with the internal forces of the human being, with the astros, with the stars. People ignore that. You then uh, inquire about that when you read the Bible, for instance. And you see... What forces are associated with what is written there? Because it is stated that that sacred language that we spoke in the beginning has its own grammar, its own letters. The Nordic alphabet is associated with it. The Hebrew alphabet, the Chinese, this force is associated with the language. So that is precisely written by initiates. Initiates that developed that power of objective reasoning and they wrote the books. So in order to understand, to comprehend what is written in the Bible, what is written in the Koran, what is written in many other books, Sanskrit books for instance, of Buddhism, you had to develop a list certain percentage of the chakra of your throat because it is what gives clarity audience. Sometimes people said, I listen to you, I am hearing it, but I do not understand. Is that the magic ear? To understand what I am saying, to comprehend what it is written, you need the magic ear, the clarity audience. Because the word is not only spoken, but also written. And that's why it's written with those characters. Hebrew characters, Arabic characters, which are coming from those that ancient times. The Nordic runes, for instance, are those characters created with the forces of nature. And to grasp that, to understand that, is the power of the Holy Spirit. Because bina is the word that means intelligence, understanding, comprehension in Hebrew. And as the Sephirah related with the Holy Spirit. Keter is the Father, Chochma is the Son, and Binah is the Holy Spirit. That divides itself into two, the two forces that we are studying here. The animal forces that we have to transmute because the Holy Spirit is the creator. The creator of life. And the destroyer as well. That's why you find in India that Shiva represents the Holy Spirit. Because Brahma is the father, Vishnu is the son, and Shiva is the Holy Spirit. And Shiva is a creator and a destroyer. The forces, of course, of the Holy Spirit can destroy by knowing how to apply them, the bull, in order to acquire mastery. And that is how also Shiva is associated with the bull. 
in India. Parvati is a cow. His wife. And in every single religion, you find the symbol of the bull. But to sacrifice a bull, as is written in the many uh, aspects in the Bible, this is this black magic. Because you don't resolve anything by killing a poor animal that is in a state of evolution in order to satisfy your own necessities. The bull that we have to kill, the behemoth that we have to kill, is inside of us. It's our own animal nature. It's like when the Bible or the Quran or other books says, for instance, the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says you have to fight your relatives to Arjuna. And Arjuna says, how? I have to kill my, uh, my, my aunt, my cousins, my, my nephews. I have to kill my uh, uncles. Yes, says Krishna, you have to. But it's not referring, of course, as people think, people in the outside world. It's inside of us. All of those people that we have to kill, that we have to annihilate, defects, vices, errors, symbolize in different ways. And we do it with the power of the bull. But when we forget about that, and we identify with the power of this materialistic world, then we worship the forces of the bull in the wrong way. The golden calf. But the Israelites in the beginning were guided according to Moses in the right way. But in the end when he came back from the Mount Sinai he found them that he, they were no longer doing the work inside themselves. They were just worshipping the bull in the wrong way. Trying to be greedy. Because the power of the earth the power of the world is also related to with black magic. That's the golden calf. And then people forgot about the real work that we have to perform is inside. The Tarinian mysteries are the way in which the levels in which the human being develops objective reasoning in order to understand God. Simple like that. You see? I repeat again. It is written. In the beginning was the word, the war was with God, and the war was God. Everything was created with the power of the word. So the Darwinian mysteries teach us that in order to comprehend God, we have to have knowledge. That, Gnosis, we have to develop the chakra, Vishuddha, to comprehend what is written, to comprehend the word of God. It's not the power of tongues, but in this day and age, some sects of Christianity state that the power of tongues is to, how you say, to bubble words with no sense. I saw many, many times in TV that people are talking, saying, and all of a sudden they pronounce something incoherent. And they say that that's the power of tongues, that the Holy Spirit is giving them that no sense. This is how people misunderstand, you know, the powers of God. God is not making or bubbling words just, as you said, incoherent. God is intelligence. So if you said that you have the power of tongues, you have to give understanding, comprehension, and to comprehend what is written. The symbol of what is written in the Bible, in any book, that's the power of tongues. It could be developed in different levels. But in the initiation, in the Taurinian mysteries, the initiates wants to comprehend God. That's the goal. They want to understand what God is within them. And the only way to understand God is by developing objective reasoning. Because this is what God wants. To create a being that will understand him in order to utilize him. That's why we said in many lectures that the absolute, the ends of, doesn't know itself. It's unknowable to itself. But he wants to know himself. 
And that's why creation exists. Objective reason in order to know. And through the consciousness is how we know God. By fighting the bull, by developing that, and then acquiring different levels of objective reasoning. That's why in the cosmos you find many levels of human beings that understand the meaning of the word, the meaning of God. Let us start from above, from the top, according with what we know. We are not going to state that he is the only one, but the only one that we know in the planet Earth who has the higher level that is on top of the pyramid in knowing God is Jesus of Nazareth, whose name is Averamento. He acquired the higher level of understanding, of reasoning. He knows God in relation with infinite, with the infinite. Below him, there are other initiates that understand God in other levels. Because we have to understand that the universe, the word, creates seven cosmoses. Seven. The first cosmos is called the protocosmos and is located with the unknowable dimension. So the protocosmos is made by all the stars, all the suns of the universe, which is the foundation or the base of any infinite. Below the protocosmos, we find the Iocosmos, which is manifested. Because I said the protocosmos is not manifested, but the Iocosmos is manifested. It's what in Kabbalah is called Atziluth. And the unmanifested is called the Ains of Or, the solar absolute. There are many in Atziluth that have understanding of God at that level. They're called, of course, cosmocreators. Below that cosmos, you find that the macrocosmos, which is the cosmos that people talk more about. The macrocosmos is related with other levels of understanding of God. There are many beings that are at that level. Below the, micro, or the macrocosmos, you find the defterocosmos. The defterocosmos is in relation with any solar system. Any individual that has knowledge or developed understanding in relation with the solar system is an individual of the deftrocosmos. Below the deftrocosmos we find the mesocosmos which is the planet Earth. Any planet in itself is a mesocosmos. So if you acquire development and knowledge in relation, the power of tongues in relation with your planet you are a mesocosmos individual. You know that in the mesocosmos, in the planet or any planet, there are many microcosmoses. We call ourselves microcosmoses. But these microcosmoses are not developed. They could be developed in different levels. I said the higher level is the one that is on top and whose name is Abermenthal, Master of Jesus, Master Jesus of Nazareth. But below are many levels. Here we are in this room learning about this knowledge and we have to start understanding, comprehending in our own level this wisdom. And for that we have to start developing the clarity audience which give us that understanding, that comprehension. That's why the simple uh, practice that we always advise is a vocalization of the letter E. That the sound should be E H A. E E That's simple. Just sense the vibration in your throat. Because if you vocalize the E sound, E vibrates here. 
E, but A is here. A. That put an activity the chakra of the throat. Of course, any prayer is always related with the throat. And when you do that, you are transmuting your sexual force to the throat. And the clary audient power, the power of the tongues, start to develop. And then you understand more and more deep the wisdom of God. Not only written in the Bible, but in other books. And then when you read something, immediately you find if that is precisely something that was written by Moses or by the prophets, or something that a black magician put it there in order to confuse humanity. As I said, the chapter 29 of Exodus is not written by Moses. It was put there to sacrifice the bull. Only the black magicians sacrifice bulls. Still in India, they worship the cow and they respect. And they know that if they want to sacrifice something, it will be the animal within. Of course, this is the level, but below the microcosmos is the tritocosmos, or tritocosmos. You see? Tritocosmos, microcosmos, mesocosmos, defterocosmos, macrocosmos, Io cosmos and proto cosmos. There are the seven cosmoses. Beginning from the top, I mean from the bottom. The trito cosmos is what the people call hell, inferno, Avicii, Klipoth. That's a confusion of tongues. So there are many people there that appear uh, saying that they have the power of tongues, but they have the power of the confusion of tongues. Just bubbling words with no sense, that's not the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we have to be in chastity in order to understand that. And this is how you develop the Taurinian mysteries. It is written that when you acquire the level, the higher level, or any level of the Taurinian mysteries, then horns of light appear on top of your head. That horns of light Remind us the horns of light of Moses. Or oh, the silver horns of the Nordic gods that appear. The meaning that they know what they do. The power of Taurus. Do you recall, for instance, uh, in this very moment, it's coming into my mind, the Tuva. Or the tubas. This is, I think this is how they are called. These are uh, uh, what do you call it? The riders. The bull riders. Those people that uh, control the herds from one side to the other. They are in Texas, there are many places. Of course, in Mongolia, there's these uh, uh, cowboys. You see how they call cowboys? Because they manage with the cows. They control it with, they know that they have to sing. They have beautiful sons in order for the cow to hear. And this is how they control the cows, the herds, you see, by pronouncing, by singing. These Mongolian cowboys are really amazing. They have the way in which they manage to control the throat, the, the sound of the throat in many ways. And that's very common in Mongolia. In the ancient times, the cowboys uh, in this area of the United States and Canada knew how to sing. I don't know if still they sing. But this is how they control the, the, the cattle. This is how also we control our own particular individual bull by the, with the power of the word. And that's why the most beautiful prayer that we can utter in order to bring the forces of above in order to control our own inferior forces is the prayer of the Lord. 
the Pater, no Pater Noster, given by Jesus, which is a prayer that has to be combined with meditation. A beautiful prayer. Do you have questions? The prayer of the Lord is, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because thine is the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever and ever. You see here, at the end is something there that people don't say. It. Because thine is the glory. That's the energy of the solar force in us. The power, which is in the sexual organs. The kingdom is Malkut, the physical body. Thine is the kingdom. Meaning it says, because yours is my physical body, which is the kingdom, Malkut. Yours is. And the glory of it, which is all the energy that is in the blood, in all the nervous systems. That's the glory, which is the energy, the solar force that circulates. And the power in my sexual force. This is at the end of that prayer. In order to bring the forces and to control the bull. So what practices can we use to transmute that sexual energy? The single people learn how to transmute their sexual force with exercises of pranayamas. Prana is a Sanskrit word which means energy. And yama, breathing or respiration. So by the science of breathing, we transmute the prana, the energy of the sexual force. There are many types of pranayamas. Uh, we have many of them. A simple pranayama, for instance, is just to sit down in a chair, relax the body, and breathe slowly. Imagining that at the moment that you breathe, the sexual force is going up to your brain and entering into your heart through the spinal column. And when you exhale the air, just pronounce the letter F. This is what is called the still small sound. There is written that Elias heard the way in which the sound, the sound of the S, transmute the force. There are many mantras, but that's a simple one. And of course, the best way in order to transmute the sexual energy is in the sexual act. So for that, we cannot explain here because it's very more complicated. But we have books. But the perfect matrimony in other books where we explain very carefully how to do the transmutation of the sexual energy in the sexual act with our spouse. You have any other question? So in other words, you're not saying that a true initiate must be celibate for his whole life. Well, uh, the celibate initiates were preparing themselves in order to practice uh, as, as Mary, of course, the uh, sexual alchemy before entering into the higher mysteries. Many young people that enter into this path, they learn how to transmute their sexual energy as single. But later on in time, they know that they have to marry because celibacy is good at a certain level. It's good when you know how to transmute the sexual energy. But you are in celibacy and, and you know how to transmute, then it's, it's wrong. Because then the sexual force, instead of creating something good, is creating a behemoth, something ominous within you. You know how to control the force. And later on in time, when you are ready, you will marry and transmute the sexual energy as a couple, which is precisely the best way in which the sexual energy creates within you. And that's precisely the way we would say in which the torero is already doing it. Because in the beginning, as we said in the Tauromachy, or bullfighting, the people start riding the horse 
and trying to dominate the beast with the lance. The lance is always the symbol of the sexual force. If it's a man, it's a symbol of the phallus, of the sexual energy. But remember, when we talk about the phallus, this is something very important here. Because uh, women think that when the, we talk about the lance, it's only related to men. But women also has a phallus, which is called the clitoris, where the magnetic forces work with. That's why you find that uh, in the Nordic mythology, for instance, you find the Valkyrias, which are women warriors that were riding horses with a lance, and sometimes with a sword. How come? Well, they have their feminine force of the lance in their clitoris. But the man, of course, is the one that takes more of that energy because the man has the phallus. The clitoris is a, an atrophied phallus. The woman takes more the feminine aspect of the Holy Spirit and the man the masculine. That's where when we talk about, for instance, the Holy Grail, which is the cup, is a symbol of the woman, the feminine yoni. So this is how you, you understand and comprehend that you have to utilize those forces in order to dominate the bull. How to dominate with that, to transmute those sexual forces by sexual or pranayama and dominate the, the bull until it becomes a tame ox that will eat only grass. And not that furious animal that uh, in the beginning we had to control. Yes? Transmutation means to transform one substance into another. To sublimate means to rise that force up. In the beginning, of course, you uh, transmute. Anybody, for instance, when he's uh, transmuting the sexual energy, is changing because the pranayama of the sexual magic teaches you how to transmute, how to change, how to mutate, which is called transmutation. Mutation. The sperm in the oven transforms into energy, and the energy rises. But according with your behavior, according to what you speak, according to what you think, that then you can be sublimated different octaves. The first octave, that then it has to be sublimated, is the physical octave. Then the vital body, then the astral body, the mental body, causal body, Beauty body, atmic. Remember that the true man is seven bodies. To sublimate the energy in the atmic body, you need to perform the sexual act as when you are in church. Praying. You see? I remember in this very moment a case when we were visiting the Master Samael on the Or in Mexico with a group of students that I had in Chihuahua, Mexico. And uh, the students were asking the Master Samael on Vera about transmutation. Well, said the Master, you are beginners. So you have to start as you are because I don't think that you can practice uh, at the level of a saint that is working with Adman. The level of Adman, you know. Adman is here. And we are here, sometimes down, you know, in Klippas. I'm pointing here the, the Sefria Chesed. And I said, we are here, means the Sephira Malkut. And when I say sometimes down, means into Klippoth. So how a demon of Klippoth will practice sexual magic as somebody in the level of Chesed? It's impossible. A saint, said the Master, practice in this way. In his direction, of course, he says. But the direction comes naturally when you have sexual force. Penetrate his woman, and just stayed like this, he says. And he was quiet. Imagining that his hands were on top of the bed and was connected with the woman. Transmuting, he says. And then he looked at, because there were two girls who were asking that. Would you like to have a husband like that? And then one of, they, uh, one of them says, no, oh, come on. What do you want a man like that? Well, you see, 
So you need your level. This is obviously in the beginning, as uh, the Apostle Paul says. In the beginning is the animal. And later is the spiritual. So in the beginning, all of us, when we discover our last, well, we have to transmute it, but in the level in which we are. Do not expect because people think in the beginning that they have to be like saints. Sometimes a woman is sleeping. Hey, wake, you have to transmute. And they are just by himself doing it, the work. Right? But little by little, both of them have to learn how to reach higher levels. Because the energy has to be sublimated even to be now and beyond. But if you have the bull alive, scratching the ground, you know, in order to go against you, how do you expect to do the sexual magic like a saint? A torero will do it because already controlled the beast. But a beginner is on top of the horse trying to control the bull and do it what he can. Little by little is transforming and sublimating and sublimating until reach the levels in which has a lot of control in the sexual energy. That's why we state we don't have to discourage if in the beginning we have uh, falls, downfalls, because the bull is very strong. But we have to keep ahead because our goal is to become a torero with solar bodies. Understood? This is how you enter into the mysteries of Taurus. Taurian mysteries. The Taurumaki. With the power of your word. This is how you acquire the power of tongues. This is how you become a true human being with objective reasoning. Which is not the crude and rough intellect that we have. Come another question. Well, uh, uh, the uh, the meat of the bull is related to the earth. I mean, the animal itself, the symbol of the earth. But in that meat, as you see, uh, as we explain in other lectures, behemoth, the animal, the bull, is the strength that we have. But that strength comes from the blood. And the blood is a symbol of the fire. So in the flesh of the bull, the flesh of the cattle you find the fire of the earth. And that's why the lion needs that fire of the earth in order to feed itself. If we want Texas, the fire of the earth, when I said the earth, I'm talking about Malkut. You understand that? Because Malkut is the planet earth itself. Our physical body is also Malkut. The three-dimensional physical body. So in Malkut, you find the forces of the elements, which are symbolized by the Sphinx. And that's why Ezekiel, he says that on top of the four animals of the alchemy, he saw the son of man. What are those four animals of alchemy? According to Ezekiel in the Bible, it says, that have the appearance of a man. But one has the face of an eagle, which is the air. The face of a man, which is the water. The face of a bull, which is the earth. And uh, the other face of a lion, which is the fire. So those are the Hayot HaKadosh, the holy creatures, in which all the forces of the elements are then. So... When you see the, the bull, of course, within the bull is the fire that we need in order to feed ourselves. The meat, the red meat, beef, but that symbolizes the earth. Comprehend it? Other question? Thank you very much. And uh, next Saturday, we don't have lecture. 
We're going to suspend uh, and we will have it within the 15 days. Next Saturday. Not this, not this one that is coming, but the next one. The will be in August. August the 5th will be the next lecture. Thank you very much and uh, control your bull. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.